The Attorney General of the Federation, Abubakar Malami, hints at emergency rule in Anambra State following recent violence there. And the Pandora Papers throws more light on Nigerians with shell companies and accounts in tax havens. We'll be discussing with journalist Nicholas Ibekwe of Premium Times. And also this morning, we will, as always, be reviewing the papers. Glad to have you join us here on The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. I am Osaogi Ogbon. Welcome to the Thursday morning edition of The Breakfast. And we hope that we have a very interesting run. We hope that you've had a very interesting night's rest and you're ready for Thursday. I'll start this morning, as always, with uh, trending stories across uh, the country this morning. Uh, first of all, it is in Anambra State where elections are set for the 6th of November. But as political parties are jostling, you know, to put their houses in order, uh, the people of Anambra have also, you know, tried to figure out if they will be voting or not. One of the most important uh, perspectives really is uh, voter apathy. And if there's going to be many people uh, showing up to vote and looking at also the number of registered voters currently in Anambra and how many of those people will come out to exercise uh, their uh, rights to vote. Uh, but of course, it's, it's many reasons, and that we've spoken about this even yesterday, the different reasons why uh, we may not see that many people coming out to vote. And one of them is the insecurity challenge that the Southeast has been experiencing in the last long while, a couple of weeks, months maybe. Um, and of course, that has led the uh, Minister of Information, um, 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 Abubakar Malami, I beg your pardon, uh, to make statements yesterday saying that the federal government is considering uh, declaring a state of emergency in Anambra State to ensure that the election goes through peacefully. Um, if you remember also, the army has also started its own uh, military operations in the southeast, and that will cover Anambra State also. Uh, but of course, it didn't go down well with a lot of people who saw this as, you know, a little off, you know, seeing that there's been security challenges in many other states across the country, mostly in northern Nigeria, that have not gotten the same call for a state of emergency. Kaduna State, for example, has had numerous kidnappings, has had numerous, you know, killings, murder by bandits, by Boko Haram, by whichever group that you can imagine. Um, every other day in the news, we report about 18 people, 30 people, 20 different numbers, dozens, basically, um, of Nigerians that have lost their lives the night before in Kaduna State. Um, and of course, you know, there's never a call for a state of emergency. And that's really where the controversy concerning uh, this is. Aside those who are asking, you know, does um, the Minister of Justice about Abubakar Malami really have the right uh, to declare a state of emergency anywhere? Um, you know, does he have that authority to, de to declare a state of emergency? It doesn't seem so. But aside that, why is Anambra State, you know, being looked at as, you know, as troublesome enough to declare a state of emergency? Um, I'm, I'm going to share a couple of the statements and reactions um, uh, to this. Um, there's a person here who said, who responded, so elections are now more important than hundreds of innocent Nigerians that have been killed on a daily basis in the north. Uh, says the core mandate of government is to protect lives and properties and not to conduct elections by declaring state of emergency. This is a better option for the North. Um, a guy called uh, Shegun Empire. Um, and of course, uh, somebody here also says his name is uh, Babajide Onye, Onye Dot. <laughs> it says, this is the end game. Declare a state of emergency so the election can be comfortably stolen. Between IPOB and gunmen, known and unknown, the Anambra people are about to have you know, a stooge imposed on them. Well done, everyone. Um, and, and so, you know, everyone might look at these as, you know, extreme statements and, you know, say, oh, you know, you're probably reaching too far. But you can't also, you know, stop people from feeling this way, seeing the disparities and seeing, you know, how far-fetched, you know, a state of emergency is, is um, in Anambra State. Um, seeing that also that there's still the Nigerian police force, there's still the NSCDC, and I've repeatedly said this, that there is enough of the security agencies that should be able to carry out proper investigation, should be able to end the killings in Anambra State. When I say it like that, it makes it sound like it's as bad as it, it's, um, um, it is in the North. It really isn't as bad as it has been in Northern Nigeria. But at least the little pockets of violence here and there, the attacks at security agencies, uh, the attacks on INEC offices, the attacks on policemen uh, here and there, um, there's, I'm sure, 
enough of Nigeria's security agencies to end these things, to arrest these perpetrators, to ensure that they completely make Anambra State peaceful. But the reason that is not happening is, you know, what is really, really shocking for everyone. How much will it take and what will it really cost for Anambra State to become peaceful again? Um, in what ways do the security agencies need to act better to ensure that Anambra State is peaceful again? Who needs to be arrested? Who's, who's the source of the arms and ammunition that is flowing into an Anambra State uh, into the hands of these criminals? Either IPOB or not IPOB. Nobody really knows. Um, and so, you know, if those actions are not taken, then why are we jumping 19,000 steps ahead to go declare a state of emergency? And that's really where the controversy is. Um, Fishai Shoyombo, uh, who's a very popular investigative journalist, um, also made his own statement. He says, you want to declare a state of emergency in Anambra, but you haven't contemplated it for states like Kaduna and Co, ravaged by terrorism, banditry, and general insecurity. It means elections are more important than lives. Our leaders are, are more interested in politics than governments. This basically is the general um, reaction um, I'm sure 9 out of 10 people who have seen that story from Abubakar Malami reacted the same way um, concerning the idea of a state of emergency in Anambra State. Um, and of course, the fear is that, you know, this might be one of the tactics to, you know, take the elections from the people and the electorate in Anambra State who really wants to vote their conscience and a candidate that they choose. We'll see how it goes. And of course, a state of emergency, you know, doesn't that also increase the voter apathy in the state? If a state has a state of emergency that has been declared in the state, how many people are going to be eager to come out with their voters' cards and actually vote? Um, so I, 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 of course, would say that these are some of the knee-jerk reactions and knee-jerk statements that are being made every now and then by persons in the current administration that they don't really think certain statements through before you know, making them. They don't also think certain decisions through before making them. And it also gives space for those who say that some of the, you know, acts of violence in Anambra State, you know, conspiracy theorists will say are state-sponsored. They're sponsored by persons in the government, you know, to try to create that narrative. You know, this might be entirely false. But it, it creates a space for people to make those type of insinuations and statements like that. That's our first step, uh, top trending story. We'll move away from Anambra now and go to international news media, CNN, who, uh, you know, had a, there was an interview yesterday with... Uh, the Nigerian government, um, um, or the Nigerian president's uh, aide on new media, a special advisor on new media, Tolu Ogunlesi, who, um, of course, uh, if you look back in history, is an award-winning journalist, you know, fantastic journalist, you know, I, I guess. Um, but since, you know, the coming of this administration, and of course, since he uh, got appointed in this administration, you know, a lot of people have questioned um, some of the statements that he's made and, you know, the stance that he has taken. It is expected, you know, that, of course, since you work for the administration, you would always defend the administration. You're never going to go on international news or any other platform and, you know, speak bad or speak ill about uh, the administration that you work for. But it is definitely one of the most difficult jobs to continue to defend certain policies of the current administration. I don't even, I, I'm not sure which, you know, is harder. Uh, the people who worked as White House press secretaries during Donald Trump's uh, time in the White House or the people who currently have to defend the current administration here in Nigeria and, you know, defend their policies every now and then. We're going to play a few clips for you so you see what exactly I'm talking about. He was um, on an interview on CNN yesterday speaking about the Twitter ban in Nigeria. And this is what Tolu Ogunlesi had to deal with. In the beginning, was Twitter suspended in Nigeria because yeah. it deleted a tweet by President Buhari? Um, you know, so it was, it, it's a, the, the context is a lot bigger than that. But of course, from a media point of view, you find that, you know, usually, and this is not just in Nigeria, there's often um, an event or, an, or, or something that happens that kind of triggers something else. But, you know, the context so the which trigger it, it for tends this to be a larger one. Tolu, the trigger for the suspension was because Twitter deleted a tweet by President Buhari, which violated its terms of service. Um, well, so that's that's very debatable. I do not um, th that tweet um, was not. I, I I do not believe that that tweet violated the terms of service of Twitter, and it's of course uh, it leads us to the question of um, uh, how does local content and local context 
Um, how is in Twitter fact, you bring up context, um, which is important, because as a Nigerian and anybody who's followed yeah, the look, context understands yes. that when you talk about people yeah. who misbehave will be treated in the language they understand, that is an incitement to violence yeah. in their plain meaning. That's why Twitter no, took down no, that, uh, that tweet, no, because it's seen not. as inciting people to violence. No, no, absolutely not. Um, the, the president spoke in his um, capacity as uh, the president of Nigeria, and it was a law enforcement message. Um, it is a law, I think I believe. Let's go back to the beginning. Was Twitter suspended in Nigeria because yeah. it deleted it? So somebody who tweets, mostly President Buhari's praises, do you support the Twitter ban? Um, well, so, I, I, you know, I, it's... I, it's um, I'm not, you know, the Ni government of Nigeria has made a decision, you know, um, like men, like all governments are so expected to. That's not a yes, to, sir. That's and not a for yes, me, sir. It's Do not, you support the Twitter ban? And for me, no, so it's not, um, I, I'm not sure that's the question that you should be asking me. I think it's a win-win, actually, for both, uh, for both, for Twitter and the government of Nigeria. That's certainly the view I get right. out of the, uh, uh, from the negotiations. So that's we'll, a win-win for, for both parties. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy, happy about that. All right, Tolu, I have to leave it there. I'm not sure it's a win-win when a lot of people just go use virtual private networks and bypass the ban. So I'm not sure how much of a win-win that is, but we're going to have to leave it there. Tolu Gunles, a special assistant yeah. to the president of Nigeria on digital and new media. Thank you for your time. Well, a lot of people have said they've never seen Tolu Gunles stutter that much. Um, even a husband who has been caught in the act with, a, you know, by his wife wouldn't. <laughs> Stutter, stutter as much as Tolugu Lissi started yesterday. Um, just still simply trying to defend certain things. And, you know, you, you, if you watch the full six-minute interview, you might also tell that, you know, not very much was said. Uh, you know, a lot of, you know, not very much sense, you know, was actually made, um, you know, with certain questions that he was asked. You know, do you support the ban? It's a yes or no question. You know, and, you know, you should, you know, be able to say, yes, I support the ban for this reason or that reason. Um, but it was a lot of stuttering. Um, from Tolo Gunlesi. You know, it, and these are some of the things that have made, you know, a lot of talking points across the country, um, you know, because of how difficult it is to support and to, you know, be uh, a face, you know, to support some of the things that uh, the current administration has, you know, done or put in place. Um, he found himself on the hot seat yesterday and, you know, a lot of people have been reacting to that. But I will also share that aside, you know, where he currently is and, you know, I also saw people say, you know, he, he probably tweets you know, better than he speaks. Um, but besides that, you know, I'm going to, you know, quickly mention something that was pretty critical or was pretty interesting, you know, with this whole discussion. Um, in 2014, 2013, 2014, you know, build up to the elections, um, um, he was one of the most vocal people on social media. This is the same to Logan Lissi now, who, of course, is advising on better use of social media. He was one of the most vocal people on social media criticizing the previous administration. He wrote the script, and I saw this on um, um, a particular person's uh, page, that he, Tolo Gosi wrote the script um, for a particular um, cartoon, or, you know, a particular, you know, yeah, a cartoon, basically, a propaganda cartoon, uh, that basically saw or showed former President Goodluck Jonathan and Abu Bakr Shakar, the leader of Boko Haram, whining and dining, you know, creating that narrative that they both were one and the same and they, you know, were working together. He wrote that script and they post out all of that on social media. The governor of Kaduna State, Nasser Arufai, also used the same social media platforms to create whatever narrative whatsoever that they wanted to create back then. I remember that there is still, I believe it's still online, a tweet by a former president, not by a current governor of Kaduna State, Nasser Arufai, where he, you know, alleged that former President Goodluck Jonathan had, um, you know, a plan. There was a Boko Haram plan with the government, and these are the things that they had laid out. You know, it was going to go from this stage to that stage. You know, it was a, you know, pretty much detailed plan. You know, that um, um, Rufai had put out on social media then, and even said that Goodluck Jonathan had put him on a list of people to be executed. You know, that he had brought in snipers into the country. Those are some of the very wild allegations that they freely put out back then on social media. I have also spoken to a man since I've been here on Plus TV Africa. There's a particular person that I spoke with um, on, um, on a report um, some, somewhere along Admiralty here in Lekki Phase 1. Um, 
uh, you know, who very was complaining bitterly about the current administration and how, you know, things were t completely difficult for him and he was living a very, very terrible life and he regrets ever supporting the current administration. But do you know who that person is? If you remember months ago, not months ago, actually, in 2014, in the build-up to the election, there was a particular picture that went viral on Twitter, a man who carried a goat and hung up, you know, a, a piece of paper or, or a carton on the goat's neck and wrote, of course, good luck, Jonathan, or I am good luck, Jonathan, or something like that on that goat's neck. Um, that same person freely had the time and, you know, had all the freedom to express those very, very insulting uh, messages to former President Goodluck Jonathan in 2014. You know, fast forward now, he doesn't have that freedom anymore. Um, and so Tolo Ogunlesi, back to him, is one of those people who had the freedom to say whatever allegations, to put out whatever type of statements that they felt like in 2014 against the former um, president, but now are preaching for a safer social media space and, you know, how, you know, Nigeria and Twitter have, have been negotiating and they're trying to mend fences and, you know, finding ways that, you know, they, they, you know, they can have a more responsible um, media space. It's just very, very difficult to put all of this together. But anyway, those are our two, to uh, two top trending stories this morning. I hope that you did enjoy them. This morning, we will be speaking with Nicolas Sibikwe. He's uh, one of the major um, conversations we're having on the program this morning to discuss something called Pandora Papers. If you have been following that hashtag across all social media platforms, um, of course, it has hit Nigeria. A new one dropped this morning that involves President Mohamed Buhari, um, um, former Lagos State Governor Bola Ahmed Tinubu, um, Boyega Oyetola, and of course, um, Deziani uh, Madweke. A couple of names, you know, have made... Uh, Pandora Papers for this morning. And we'll be talking to Nicolas Ibekwe about the whole of it um, on the show this morning. So don't move a muscle, stay with us. Welcome once again to The Breakfast. <laughs>